Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, as Dave mentioned, I'd like to talk now a little bit about, um, um, about some specific challenges in data and um, recording data. In particular, I'm going to talk about two, two particular areas. And I'll make reference to uh, how we associate these data with herpetological specimens and with herpetological inventory work, but um, this, would, this could easily apply to anything. So I just wanted to introduce some of these ideas and topics and show you how we've solved the problems with amphibians and reptiles. But um, a lot of these are generalizable to any other group, I guess, um, that have the same properties. So just to start out with, here are some of the ways in which data are represented in either um, in, a, in our database with ideally with the whole suite of data from the museum permanent catalog number, the field collector number, genus, species, country, island, um, more specific data, and then uh, local names, mountains, and then the, the, G the GPS coordinates, right? The sort of whole Darwin core, and, th and then some things that you might want to collect. But you also look at um, different ways in which you find data in, in catalogs or in, in people's field notes, and, um, and these vary widely. So, for example, here's a, someone's field catalog that has a list of species, um, and they've got X marks in these boxes. And then there's some data filled in here, but then there's not for some specimens. And then why are all these columns blank? And what does that mean if they're left blank? Does that mean there's no data? Or well, what does all that mean? Um, and, so, um, and so when it comes to associating data with individual specimens, I guess what I, the, the thing I want to emphasize is there's a core group of things that we really want to get and we want to associate them directly with each specimen. And we want to be able to go eventually back to that record and say, here's the, sp the specimen that we're interested in. I think this is a new species of frog. For the first specimen I collected, what was it doing and what time of day was it and what are all the data that apply to it? And so what I want, really want to talk about now is how to associate ecological data with every single specimen and how we might associate all the necessary data with that single specimen if we make an audio recording of it. But this would also apply to if you take a special sample from it, or if you take a photograph from it, or some special use of that one specimen. If you have associated additional types of data, how do you make sure that those data go with that single specimen and that next month or next year when you go back to your notes, you're not confused and try to wonder which recording went with which frog, for example. So um, to start with, you know, as a, a sort of fundamentally, ideally what we'd want are um, the full locality data with each specimen information on atmospheric conditions, like the weather, the habitat data, and by habitat I mean all those ecological properties that you might be interested in, and that could encompass a spreadsheet that has 50 individual cells in it, you know, or 50 columns in it when we're talking about the habitat data. The habitat data, depending on your research, could mean all sorts of things, but, but if we're just talking about standard museum collections, what are the habitat data that we want to collect? What are, at a minimum, what are the habitat data that we want to have associated with each and every specimen? Uh, you might want to take data about the individual condition of the animal, what, what kind of shape it's in, does it look like it's healthy. You might want to take in information about its reproductive status, whether it's a mature male in breeding season, whether it's a gravid female that has eggs that have been uh, eggs that are fully developed and she's in mating season, all that information. And then, of course, any specialized or ancillary data. Okay, so when we look at people's field notes in various museums, they take all different forms. and, and um, and yesterday, Town gave you a great example of, of a very specific format, the Grinnell project format, and Grinnell's standard uh, suites of data that, that he and others developed that were collected with, with all the specimens early on at the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology at, Har at, um, at Berkeley, which were taking a field catalog, making a book that's a, a set of notes that is a um, species account, and then making a set of notes that's essentially your, your field diary. Um, and people do things in different ways, and so here's a picture out of the field, book, uh, field notebook of our, co our colleague Dave McLeod, who was drawing a picture of his field site, and there's lots of information there about where he might have found amphibians. And then his sort of um, itinerary, or his, his um, narrative description of what that field site was like, and what kinds of things he did there. And these can be really useful, you just have to read the whole thing and, and pick the data out of a sentence format. Um, here's another way to represent it. Um, here are individual um, ac accounts of this specimen, number 1186. Here's its, its identity, and here's all the information that that person collected and associated with the data. Its snout vent length, its mass, habitat, its identity, things like that. 
So again, these are sort of the, the minimum. But you also, in this situation or in others, you might take notes on, people have traditionally taken notes on the color of the specimen, taking color notes while it's still alive. You sort of before digital photography, this was standard practice. You might take notes on its body size and mass, its temperatures in life. And of course, if you're recording temperature, you want to do this really carefully and record it as quickly as possible. Because if you hold the frog in your hand, it's, gonna, it's body temperature is going to get warmer because of your own body heat. So you have to take all those things into account. And then of other things, you might want to make notes of which specimens you tissued or which specimens you took photographs of, all that kind of information. And as uh, we've made this point a couple times, and Dave just uh, discussed again, it's really helpful when you're taking, trying to take rich, full data for every specimen to do this in an organized fashion with different people doing different tasks. And so you can see these students of Dave McLeod's. One person's taking tissues. Another person is set up to take measurements and mass. This person's writing in the catalog and taking color notes. This person's making labels for the tubes and taking tissues. And this person is pre prepping the specimens and putting them out in a tray. And setting up a conveyor belt of people doing different tasks is a great way to, um, to make sure they're standardized and make sure everybody gets trained in all of the tasks because you can do this for an hour and then everyone switch positions and each person gets to try some of everything. And I think that's a really great way, especially if you're working with people who have different levels of experience, to make sure everyone's trained in all the tasks. And you know, even if, if, if one's real interest is, is working in birds or working in herps, it helps you to go sit down with people who are working on other taxonomic groups and see how they do things because it gives you ideas about better ways that we can um, maintain the quality of our own data. Okay, so back to our data sheet. Here's a free-flowing data sheet and here is another format where each species has a, has a narrative of color notes and all the things that are written about it. Um, but I want to introduce you to one other um, and, um, and we'll just start with start with sort of the, the fundamental absolute minimum things that each specimen needs to have. And then I want to introduce you to another system that's a really convenient way to associate ecological data with each <coughs> specimen. So again, we start with a unique identifier. And that means that every specimen, individual specimen, gets a field number. And this is really critical, um, that every single specimen gets a unique number. Because essentially throughout the rest of however we use these data, however we manage the data, analyze the data, curate the data, and publish the data, this will be the unique identifier. Because in the field, you'll write down your field number that corresponds to your photograph, and you use the field number if you make a recording of that frog, and you'll use a field number if you talk about color notes, and a field number if you take a skin sample for chytrid. This is the one number that you're always going to keep going back to. And as Dave mentioned, we might assign another number to it when it gets curated in a museum, and some of these specimens go back to the California Academy of Sciences, and they'll get a California Academy of Sciences institutional catalog number. But when you use the data for any of all those diverse purposes, this is the number that we're going to keep going back to. So it's really important that everything, all the different types of data, get this number. OK, so um, yesterday we talked about um, the ways in which um, the data might be uh, summarized. And we talked about full inventories and making species lists and all the different types of lists that you could imagine doing. Daily lists, lists per site, lists for different types of habitats, and then regional faunal lists. And I showed you an example of an exercise that resulted in a regional faunal um, inventory paper. Um, so I won't go much, too much further into that other than to say that you know, here's all of the individual records for that area. But for each of those species, this is how the data actually are applied. Each of these, you know, each of these identities of each of these species have been, con have been uh, verified when we get back to the lab. But the, re the way in which we're able to um, associate the habitat data with each of these species and say that Ossetozyga halevis, for example, is a frog that's always found in water in small puddles on the sides of big rivers but never in the running water. The way we were able to associate those habitat data with that species and talk about it in this paper was, in, in this paper was because we had every specimen with a tag on it that identified that individual specimen number. And then that number was tied to an ecological, a suite of ecological uh, data types that we collected. And each of those elements came together. So, um, and I'll get to talking about that system in, in detail. But so here's an example of how we might use why some of this is important, just for the discovery factor and something I think everybody hears about in a biodiverse area like this, which is the discovery of new species. So here's a suspected possible new species of frog that we um, 
that we found in the southern Philippines a couple years ago. At, an, at a minimum, when I suspected in the field when I couldn't identify it and I wasn't sure what it was, at a minimum I wanted to make sure that every specimen got all the ecological data that I could associate with it so that each specimen I knew whether that frog came from the rocks on the river or it was on the mud on the bank or it was perched up in a tree next to the river. All of those data were associated in my field notes, and I'll show you how in just a moment. But we also wanted to have a high quality ventral and dorsal image or set of images for each specimen. And, with, and of course, you can see again that number is assigned and linked to that specimen in the photograph. So there's no question about which frog went with which, with which picture or whatever. Okay, but let me take a step back even further and talk about how we might track some information going back not a month or a year, but maybe a hundred years. <laughs> And so um, this is the story about how uh, my colleague and I, Arvind Diesmos, have been trying to recreate early collections and the data associated with some specimens that are now in museums that were collected 100 years ago. And so these were specimens that were collected by Edward Taylor, who was as a famous herpetologist who's sort of considered to be the father of Philippine herpetology. And he was a University of Kansas professor. Uh, a century ago, or when he was a young man a century ago, he went to the Philippines. And so he started collecting in 1912 to about 1915, <coughs> to about 1915 when he really got started, and then was there until about 1925. His grave site, of course, is uh, in Kansas, and we go visit like a pilgrimage every couple of years to pay our respects. Um, <laughs> and so uh, that's Arvin and I, uh, and, but we were able to go to the archives of some of his early notes. At, uh, at the Spencer Museum in the, at the University of Kansas and look through some of his notes. And here he had an annotated map of the Philippine, Philippines where he had drawn on the map the paths and the different ways that he got around on these islands. And this map is from about the 50s. It was a National Geographic magazine map. map. And he just wrote on here while he was trying to recreate his itinerary from memory which islands he went to and which sites he collected in and then the path that he took between particular sites. And so when we see a site in some of Taylor's earlier memoirs when he says that this new species of frog was collected on the trail from uh, Real to Teabas, we know that those areas, those are two towns here and that there's a road now. It wasn't, you know, back then he took a horse and went along a, a mountain trail uh, and now there's a big highway that takes that basically that same path and we know that exactly where he collected that site and he's drawn it on the map. So we're able to recreate some things doing that. Um, and then others involved us looking through his notes. Um, and so here are some notes when you can see his original, the very distinctive handwriting, and his original field number, that unique identifier that, that we use today. There's his number, EHT number 4936, and his identity and the place that he collected it, and some information about um, other areas where he caught the same species. So those have been super helpful. Um, and in some cases, he even went back. You can see, whoops, he went back and later annotated his note and changed the identification of some of the species like a year later. And those are super helpful to us because sometimes when you go to his notes, the, the species identities are not the same thing as they are now, but you can see he actually went back and made some, some adjustments to his identifications and those have been really helpful. So here, and then this is, was pretty exciting, um, going through some of his notes, trying to figure out when he went to the island of Mindoro, um, we found these notes where he wrote actually Here's EHT number 549, and he wrote Megalophrys haselti, and then he crossed it out right there, and he wrote down here N spa, which means new species, exclamation point, exclamation point. So you can see his excitement when he realized that he had a new species. He had misidentified it when he collected it, but years later he went back to his notes and, and identified it and said, it's not Heselti, it's actually a new species. And we don't know why he never described this or named this species, but we knew that 100 years ago, he knew it was a new species because we could compare it to his notes. And, uh, and then just in 2009, we were in the process of naming this frog as a new species, and we got to go back to his notes and discover that Taylor had seen it and identified it 100 years ago and knew that it was a new species. And why he never, maybe he never had the time or he was too busy or I'm not sure what happened. But indeed, he was right a century ago, and it was a new species of frog. So pretty exciting. Um, and in that case for us, it was just you know, a thrill to actually have that sort of almost live interaction with um, the father of Philippine herpetology and get this experience by going back to his field notes and associate, associate together some of the parts and some of the data that you would really like to have together before you wrote a paper and published something like a new species discovery. 
Okay, so that's a way in which you can sort of forensically, after the fact, go back and try to recreate some notes and how important they can be. But I want to tell you about a much more organized system, and that is um, someone, uh, Taylor's, um, Taylor worked on this fauna in the Philippines, but so did a very famous herpetologist named Bob Inger. And Bob Inger developed a system for habitat classification, which we've used for um, the last 20 years, and he used for all of his, he worked extensively in Borneo and Thailand and other parts of Southeast Asia. And we've used this extensively, and we've also modified it with a few additional, um, additional um, properties that we've wanted to associate with the data. So I want to walk you through this. So here is uh, a Xerox of, or a, a copy of Inger's standard field catalog. So again, remember the types of data you might want to collect if you're working in the field. You might want to collect, uh, you might want to take a diary and write down all the notes and what you did every day, and a daily itinerary. You might want to write a species account where you make a list of species and you write something about each species, about its habitat, and you summarize information for each species. And then you want to have your catalog, which is where you, um, where you inventory all the species that are there, all the specimens you've collected, and you identify them each by number and you write down exactly where you caught every single specimen and whether it has a photograph or whether it has a recording, or whether you've taken field notes on it or every single bit of information so that at any time in the future, you or anyone else can go back and reconstruct everything you did when you went to Korup National Park in 2015 in Cameroon. You can find, you can recreate every single little thing that was done. So this is identified, this is broken down into the field collector number that you would write in here the identification of the species that you would write in here, or your best guess at the time when you're in the field. And we all understand that a field identification is tentative because we're going to take the specimens back to the lab and work on them later. You write down, um, oh, I guess across the top here, you want to write down the name of the collector, you and all your colleagues and friends who are in the field together. You write down the year, and this year applies to everything else in the sheet. And you write down the full locality, and I left a lot of space here, so you can write the complete locality information the continent, the country, the province, the village name, the local city, the name of the mountain, the name of the river, the name of the little village in the area, all that information that you might want to record, and your, of course your GPS coordinates. Okay, so we write down the month and the day here, and the year is up here. We write down the exact hour using military time, so there's no confusion about what time of the day you're doing collecting. And then we go to these categories, flora, horizontal position, vertical position, stream width or DBH of tree, substrate, specific comments, sex, mass, SVL, and your GPS coordinates. And so starting with flora, we have a, a series of codes that correspond to the different ways that either Bob Inger and, uh, and my students and I have augmented this, this process. So you could divide things into primary rainforest, whether it's hilly, primary rainforest flat, deciduous forest, dry evergreen, other, and you write it down, large clearing, secondary growth, gallery forest, the kind of forest that runs along a stream when everything else has been cleared away, agricultural area, selectively logged area, and R got cut off, R was residential area because we catch house geckos on houses and things. So you, uh, and so in this case, all you can very quickly, and um, I, should, I should mention, um, you, you, hold all, you keep all this stuff together as a key. You keep a sheet in the back of your field notebook, so you always have a key that you can refer to if you can't remember these categories. But I will say this, that if you do this for a day or two, whoops, and you write down these codes, and for every specimen you put an A or a D or an E on, in these categories, you quickly memorize it because you're using it. And so now it's really fast for me when I'm writing notes. I don't have to write out specimen collected in a primary rainforest hilly along a gallery stream or whatever. I can just write A, J, E, C, and I can just, you know, after you do it, I didn't even really have to try to memorize it. Just from doing it a lot, you pick it up quickly. Okay, so that's for flora. The horizontal position, oh, I, this slide is not in order here, of course. This is me reminding you to say the, f right, it's absolutely critical that f everything get the full locality data. And if you move to a new location, you turn the page and start a new page. So each page has a single locality associated with it. And in this case, the full locality data, and I wrote all those things there. So this slide should have been before, sorry about that. 